In this video, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of why using uh, reverse proxy matters. We'll walk through the steps of purchasing a domain, handling DNS delegation, setting up an application with a Docker container, and then putting it all together by using Nginx as a reverse proxy. And to wrap it up, we'll ensure everything is secure with a Let's Encrypt certificate. I'm Philip, and let's dive right in. To help you grasp the significance of a reverse proxy, let's start from the beginning. When you want to access an application or a web page, you typically use a domain name instead of having to remember the IP address. For the purpose of our demonstration, let's pick a domain. I will go to OVH Cloud and search for Linux Cloud Hacks. Of course, you have the option to choose another domain reseller like GoDaddy or Namecheap if you prefer. Once you are on the page for registering the domain, you will see various choices. Keep in mind that some domains might appear quite inexpensive for the first year, but their prices can go significantly up starting from the second year. For the purpose of these tests, I will opt for an OVH domain because its affordability remains consistent not just for the first year, but also for the subsequent years. We won't need OVH Anycast DNS or a hosting plan, only the domain itself. Let's go ahead and make the payment for the domain. Order has been placed. I will just log into the OVH Cloud Control Panel real quick and take a look at my order status. Great, the order has been accepted. Registering a domain can take a bit of time, so let's come back here when the domain is all set up. Alright, it took about 50 minutes for the order to be completed. Now let's head over to the Web Cloud tab and click on the name of our brand new domain. Our domain is being managed by these two DNS servers. Every DNS zone comes with something called a start of authority record. We can check that entry using the dig command. To get only the essential information, we'll use the know all option, and to see answer section of the reply, we'll use the answer option. The SOA flag tells dig that we want the start of authority record, and then we provide the domain name. Now let's quickly break down the output. First up is the primary DNS server, followed by the admin email. Remember, there's a dot instead of an at. Then we have a serial number, which is like a version number that goes up whenever there are changes to the zone's data. This change in serial number tips off secondary name servers that they need to update their copies of zone file through a zone transfer. A zone transfer is basically the process of sending DNS records data from the primary name server to secondary ones. Next comes the refresh interval. The time in seconds the DNS server should wait before checking for updates from the primary server. Then there's the retry interval, which is how long Secondary DNS server should wait before trying again if a zone transfer fails. The expiry interval sets a time after which secondary DNS servers should stop using the DNS zone data if they can refresh it. Lastly, we have TTL, which is the default time the resource records should be cached by other DNS servers for clients. Moving on, let's dig into the name server record. This record is used to delegate subdomain or an entire domain to a group of authoritative name servers. These name servers are the ones responsible for providing DNS info for the specific domain. We'll use dig again, but this time with no all to clear out extra info, answer to focus on the answer section, and ns to ask for the name server record. 
Inside an NS record, you will find the domain or subdomain and the authoritative name servers that is in charge of handling DNS queries for that domain or subdomain. Our domain Linux Cloud Hacks OVH is being managed by those two OVH DNS servers. NS records play a crucial role in spreading out the work of DNS resolution, making sure that DNS queries for a domain land on the right authoritative name servers. Now, let's check how the DNS query makes its way through DNS servers. We can use dig trace command. First, we ask the Google DNS servers that set up in our resolver configured on the client. But since the resolver doesn't have info about the domain, it turns to the one of the DNS root servers that holds top-level domain data, that's .ovh. Those root servers point to Afnic France, and finally our query heads to our OVH DNS servers. We are going to make some changes to our domain's DNS settings so that Cloudflare can take over its management. Cloudflare offers an incredible DNS and CDN solution, and the best part is that it has a free tier, which is what we'll be using. I will demonstrate its capabilities in one of our upcoming videos. Once you've signed up with Cloudflare, the next step is to create a new domain entry and choose a free plan. Cloudflare will guide you through the process of replacing the current named servers with new ones they provide. Let's go ahead and do that. I will navigate back to OVH Cloud Console and update the DNS records to point to Cloudflare's DNS servers. Keep in mind that it might take some time for those DNS changes to be fully propagated across the internet. This propagation process can vary, so be patient as the updated DNS records spread through the global network. All right, our records have finally been updated. Let's take a look through the console. I'll begin by querying for SOA record. The SOA record has been successfully updated with a primary name server for the domain now set as georgianscloudflare.com. Next, we'll examine the specific name server's records by querying for NS records. Our domain has now two name server records associated with Cloudflare. To keep things tidy in the Cloudflare DNS, let's go ahead and remove the old OVH records that were transferred. Additionally, we'll run through a quick start guide to make sure everything is on track. Finally, let's trace our DNS query. Initially, the request is directed to Google, which is set up in our local resolver. From there, it moves on to one of the root DNS servers, then passes through AFNIC in France, and ultimately reaches our Cloudflare DNS. Up to this point, we've purchased a domain from OVH Cloud and entrusted the DNS delegation for that domain to Cloudflare. Let's start by setting up our application. To do this, I will install Docker, which is an open source containerization platform. We'll discuss Docker in more detail in upcoming videos. The application we'll be running is called Open Speed Test, designed to measure your internet bandwidth. Here's how to download and initiate the container using the following command. When we issue docker run, the application will start and restart unless stopped tells docker to automatically restart the application if it stops unexpectedly, unless we manually intervene. Let's name the container open speed test and the dash d flag indicates we want to run the container in the background. Using 3000 colon 3000 maps port 3000 on the virtual machine to port 3000 within the container. Essentially, if we access my server on port 3000, it will be redirected to port 3000 inside the container where the application is active. Lastly, we specify the application image to run from the Docker Hub registry. 
Running Docker Run creates a process with its own file system, networking and isolated process tree. If the image isn't already downloaded, Docker will pull it from the repository. We'll receive a container ID and we can confirm if the container is active by using docker ps command. This will show the container ID, used image, entry point, creation date, current status, port mapping and container name. Port redirection between the host network and docker network is managed through the netfilter rules. I'll delve into the details in future videos. In some cases, forwarding and translation might not be possible. In such situations, Docker uses Docker proxy operating in user space outside the kernel, responsible for warding the traffic to the container. We can check the Docker proxy process using the ss command. Now let's determine the public IP of our server. I've already exposed the VM to the internet and configured the necessary firewalls. Let's check if our application is up and running. I'll open a browser, enter the public IP and port, and voila! We can now measure our internet bandwidth using our application. First, let's address the URL. Nobody wants to enter an IP address in the address bar. Luckily, we already have a domain. To fix this, we'll head to our Cloudflare DNS settings and add an A-type record. A stands for address and point speed test Linux Cloud Hacks of EH to 129.159.240.98. To verify if our URL is correctly associated with the right IP, we'll use the host command. Perfect, our DNS is functional. Now we can access our application using the domain name. Everything works well, but there's two more issues to tackle. Firstly, the port. HTTP typically operates on port 80 TCP. While we could map our Docker to listen on port 80, a better approach is to use Nginx as a reverse proxy. Nginx will listen for HTTP requests on port 80 and route them to our backend app on port 3000. Let's install Nginx using apt install. Before we test installation, one last thing. I will update Cloudflare DNS to ensure all subdomains point to the same IP using a wildcard DNS record. We replace the speed test record with an asterisk. With this change, any subdomain will lead to the same IP. I'll explain why in a moment. Now let's configure our reverse proxy. It's best to organize the configuration by creating a file in the sites available folder for each application. Let's name this one speed test. Inside the server section, we'll set the listening port to 80. Then specify our fully qualified domain name matching our DNS entry. Finally, let's define the response for the root URI. Proxy pass directs Nginx to forward the request to our backend server, pointing to our Docker container on port 3000. Include proxy params, adds parameters to the requests. Configuration saved. Proxy params ensures Nginx includes a header field conveying the actual client IP to the backend server. Without xreadIP or xforwarded4, the backend would only see the proxy IP, not the client IP. Next, we create a symbolic link so that speed test configuration becomes visible in sites enabled. Our sites enabled folder now contains links to both the default Nginx page and the speed test application. Finally, we reload Nginx configuration with systemctl reload. Now let's access the speed test application. Nginx forwards the port 80 request to port 3000 where Docker runs our application. Now let me open the test application. We see the Nginx default page. How's that possible? 
both speed test and test domain names point to the same IP. How did Nginx know where to redirect? Let me explain. When you make an HTTP request, the client places the domain name in the host header field, indicating the desired domain. It's common to host multiple websites on the same IP using virtual hosting. Our Nginx reverse proxy reads the host header and directs the traffic accordingly. In our case, it reaches the Docker container running the speed test app. With this approach, multiple servers can listen on various IPs and ports, while the reverse proxy routes traffic based on URI and domain to the respective backend. Let's enhance security by changing the listening IP to localhost. This way, external clients can only access the application through the reverse proxy. First, let's stop the application, then remove the stopped container. The new command will map the localhost address on the left side of the mapping. We'll verify if the app is running and if the Docker proxy is listening only on localhost. Lastly, let's open the application through the Nginx proxy. It works. Let's try accessing the application directly. It does not work. Great. Of course, in real life, there would be firewalls in front that would block the direct traffic to the application, but you should always minimize the potential surface of attack. We've made significant progress, but one task remains. The application accepts only HTTP, leaving traffic unencrypted. To secure it with TLS, we'll need a certificate. Installing a certificate ensures encrypted communication, verifying our domain's legitimacy. Let's Encrypt is a company offering free SSL certificates. It's fully automated too. To get started, we'll install CertBot that simplifies certificate acquisition. The Nginx plugin handles certificate installation steps for Nginx web server. The first step for uh, CertBot is to confirm that you own the domain. It generates a challenge, which could be either a text record in your DNS known as DNS challenge, or a file on your web server, an HTTP challenge. Only you, the domain owner, can modify DNS record or place files in the web root. Let's proceed with the CertBot command. Specify the web server, in this case Nginx, and provide the domain name for the certificate. It will prompt you to accept a license agreement, and then it will issue a new SSL certificate for your domain, signed by Let's Encrypt Intermediate Certificate Authority. The certificate will be installed, and your web server configuration will be updated to enable HTTPS connections. Now, the final test. Let's access our application using the HTTPS URL. Success! The certificate is valid, though its validity lasts for 90 days. There's a systemd timer named CertBot that regularly checks if the certificate is nearing expiration and renews it automatically. I will show you the modifications made to our configuration file. Initially, the listening port was set to 443, indicating SSL usage. Then the path to the SSL certificate and certificate key were updated to ones obtained from Let's Encrypt. Additionally, SSL options were configured, followed by the path for DH parameters related to the SSL connection. There's another section for the server that listens on port 80, meaning plain HTTP without encryption. Here, how it's set up. If someone access our speed test domain over HTTP, the proxy redirects the request to the HTTPS endpoint. 